So if Rubina can, uh, yeah, stop sharing and Estelle can start sharing her slides. Um, so that we start yeah. on time. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, I can start whenever you want. <laughs> Okay, the next talk will be from Esther in my conversational neural annealing. So you can start it anywhere you're ready. All right. So um, thank you very much, the organizers, for giving me the opportunity to present um, a very recent work that hopefully will be out soon. And it's entitled version of annealing. So what we are trying to achieve here is, um, okay, one second, sorry is that we, we want to solve optimization problems. And optimization problems are ubiquitous in different areas, so be it in scheduling, in, in science, in industry, in finance. So here I gave a couple of examples. Here you have the so-called traveling salesman problem, which is a problem where you are actually, you want to know the shortest path for, let's say, a, a businessman who is traveling to a certain number of city once, and you want to know what is the shortest path of it. Right, this is another problem in, let's say, quantum chemistry, where you want to know the minimum configuration of atoms interacting via some potential. Here is protein folding problem. You want to know what is the native state of a protein. And here is portfolio optimization, where you want to know what is the best way to, to invest um, the asset you have in your portfolio. And then there are many more. So why are we physicists interested in that kind of um, problems, especially the ones that do not seem to be directly physics, physics related, like portfolio optimization or traveling system problem. So the reason is that most of these problems could be encoded in a form that we are more familiar with, which is the form of a classical easy model, right? And then the, the, the coupling constant that actually encodes the specific kind of problem and Newtonian that you're interested in. And solving this optimization problem is just simply finding what is the ground state of this classical Newtonian. But the catch is that for hard optimization problems, like for example, in glassy system, it's not using glass in random, random logical field, finding the lowest state is actually NP hard, right? And, and, and so um, uh, basically people have given up uh, the idea of finding what is the, the lowest state or if it's a degenerate uh, uh, problem Hamiltonian, what are the lowest states by finding approximate states. It is sometimes, uh, um, okay, so they use heuristic methods to do that. Uh, I'll explain in the next slides what it is. It is sometimes uh, advantageous to view this kind of classical energy as uh, some sort of energy functional over some basic configuration state or, or maybe conformation if you're putting folding problem. But for hard problems, basically this kind of energy landscape is very rude and, and it's exponentially large with a lot of number of local minima, other point of stuff like that. So what heuristic method do is that they actually perform a search in, in that landscape. And instead of finding the deepest valley in this landscape, they find valleys that are not so far from the deepest valley. So one of the methods that has been used over the years to do this kind of search is thermal annealing, where you use thermally activated process to basically overcome the barrier when you are doing the search. And this has been inspired by a very old metallurgical technique called thermal annealing, whereby to make, let's say, metal more durable or more robust, you heat it up at a very high temperature uh, to give like some sort of kinetic energy to the atoms of, of the systems, and then you slowly cool it down so that you find yourself in, in a configuration that minimizes the free energy, your free energy of, of the material. And this has been implemented on the, the, on the dedicated hardware by, by Fujitsu. Another paradigm to perform the search here is using by using quantum principle, the so-called uh, quantum turning process, whereby you basically turn it through the barriers in the search of this energy landscape. And this has also been uh, implemented on dedicated to hardware. So say you, 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 you don't have access to those hardwares and then you want to simulate either classical annealing or, or quantum annealing on your laptop. So you can still use these heuristic methods mostly based on Monte Carlo methods to simulate the annealing paradigm. But what I want to um, highlight in this slide is the fact that Monte Carlo methods originally um, are not designed to, to, to simulate an annealing paradigm. It is designed to simulate equilibrium properties of classical systems or quantum systems, right? And so we thought of um, methods, let's say machine learning, that also have the same purpose of simulating equilibrium dynamics of systems. And we got inspired by these two papers. There's this uh, very famous paper by Galio and Troyer 
where they were actually using the neural networks to find ground set properties of quantum many body systems. And this very recent paper by Wu Wang and Zhang, where they use um, neural networks to find room uh, properties of classical systems, right? So in both of those papers, they use variational principle to estimate the equilibrium properties, and they use neural networks as variational answers. So we thought of um, using this kind of framework, especially the variational framework, to actually simulate the annealing paradigm. And to do that, we use as a bedrock for the quantum case, uh, the variational Monte Carlo method, which I explain in the next slide. So this is going to be like the most technical slide of my talk. I apologize about it already. So VMC is actually a quantum Monte Carlo method that is used to simulate ground set properties of quantum system at zero temperature. The way it does that is by considering the so-called variational energy, which is the expectation value of a quantum uh, Hamiltonian over some variation state, right? And you can prove that basically this quantity is an upper bound to the exact ground set energy, whatever answer to consider. So you just have to minimize it. Right. So in practice, what you do is that you replace this quantum expectation values by some statistical expectation value where you basically, let's say, takes the average, take the average over some kind of local quantity over samples that has been generated according to this probability distribution. By construction, this probability distribution is positive. And so there's no sign from in, in version Monte Carlo, which is different from other quantum Monte Carlo methods. Right. And so when you have this framework, what you can do, you, you need to optimize the answer. This is an exact formula that you can use to find the gradients of uh, each uh, parameter that you have in your answer. You just have to replace the quantum mechanical expectation values by statistical expectation values. And then you use your, your favorite uh, optimizer, um, gradient optimizer, to basically update the parameters that you have in your answer. Right. And next. Um, the question you can ask is which kind of answer you're going to choose to, to emulate this kind of version of Monte Carlo. So as we got inspired by um, models, in, in, in by neural language models, very powerful models that are used actually to, to capture the distribution of a sequence of words, like the main characteristics of the distribution of sequence of words in natural language. And when they do that, they can actually predict what is a next word, what is the next word giving some input. So I gave an example here of a text generation, and which is basically I take a neural network that has been trained, right? And I put as input this, this sentence, the African Physical Society International Conference, and I ask the, the network to generate me some text. And you see basically that it generates pretty coherent text. So this is a machine generated text, it's not a human generated text. I don't know whether you guys talk about climate change today, but that's what the neural network is saying. And this is basically, it has, I have used this, this, this website to generate it. And what you see is that the neural network has learned to, to has learned context, right? On, on how to generate coherent sequences and that it's that learned correlation in, in the different, I mean, inputs that I have given to it. So in, in uh, a more concise way, or let's say cultural way of understanding how these, these sentences are, or these words are generated in a probabilistic way, I gave an example of a recurrent neural net, network answer, right? And so let's say that I, I want to see how this the sentence I've uh, highlighted in yellow is being generated by this kind of probabilistic model. So you give an in, as input uh, what I chose, the FPS International Conference, you pass it through an RNN and it will generate uh, a word according to some probability. In this case, it generates also. So basically you have the conditional probability of the word also giving this input, right? And then in the next RNN step, basically you give this as an input and it generates the next word and so on and so forth until it generates your last, your, all your, your last word for, for the sentence. And you see that if you take the product of this conditional probability distribution is actually the probability of having all the words in your sentence given the input for that given. So now I've been taking, talking about uh, I mean, uh, sentences, I, and this is not related with physics, but imagine that I want to generate actually a, a spin configuration, right? And so instead of having words have a spin that could be spin up and spin down. So you can still use this same kind of autoregressive sampling whereby you generate, you, you start with some inputs, you pass through your RNN, and then you basically generate this new spin configuration and so on and so forth until you basically generate your word sequence, right? So this H I've written here is a hidden state. If your RNN encodes information about the previous spin, so it somehow 
capture the, the different correlation that you have in, in your, your spin fluctuation. What is interesting is that uh, using the chain rule of the probability distribution, you actually can obtain what is the joint probability uh, uh, distribution of uh, generating this spin configuration. And we can use that to model uh, the amplitude of our wave function. In this case, for example, if it is uh, so-called a stochastic Hamiltonian, you can suppose that it's the square root of the square root distribution. So this kind of autoregressive sampling is actually um, uh, doesn't have any autocorrelation time. So compared to Markov, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, for example, if you have to generate spin configuration, you have this autocorrelation times. And for the glasses system you're interested in, it can be very, very long. And it's directly parallelizable. This is uh, another advantage of it. And then, yeah, and by construction, the wave function is normalized to, to unity, which is different from other kind of neural networks like conventional neural networks or, or uh, rested Boltzmann machine. So now we, that we have the answer that we are gonna use inside our Vaishnav Monte Carlo scheme, I can move on to explain to you how uh, we perform our Vaishnav and Lee Prize scheme in the quantum case. So what we do is that we have, let's say, energy levels with respect to some sort of, let's say, transverse state, right? Uh, that you're gonna tune somehow to perform the annealing, uh, the annealing uh, evolution. So usually when you want to implement quantum annealing, you want to prepare your system in the grounds of an Hamiltonian that is very easy. So what we do with RNNs is that we randomly initialize them, uh, the RNN uh, wave function with random weights and bias, but you want to prepare the system in this ground state. We simply do Vaisha Monte Carlo, that is we apply some gradient descent step and we land on the, 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 the ground state energy of, of that Hamiltonian. So next we need to do the annealing procedure. So we time evolve the system, what happens is that when we change the parameter in the Hamiltonian, we, 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 we actually leave the instantaneous grounds of the Hamiltonian, we need to fall back there. And so we perform gradient distance, distance steps to fall back there. And then we perform another linear step and then some gradient distance step and so on and so forth. And then hopefully when we have removed, so this is supposed to be beta x zero, we have removed all the quantum fluctuation in the system. And then we hopefully should be found in the ground state of the prime Hamiltonian that we're interested in, 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 in solving. So this is how we perform version of quantum annealing. And we came up with a version of algebraic theorem that basically bounds the number of gradient descent steps that we are supposed to, to implement if you want to remain algebraic. This delta M is basically a minimum gap during annealing and epsilon is the um, basically the overlap between the instantaneous ground state and other excited states. So to test that this is actually working, we consider the quantumism chain, right, where we have a time dependent uh, transverse field. And as a metric, we look at the instantaneous expectation value of the Hamiltonian at a given amount of time. And so we plot this, uh, the instantaneous value of the Hamiltonian respect to the transverse field as we perform the annealing. And we find that the green curve and the black curve, they fall exactly on, on, on the same, on the same, uh, they're actually the same, where the black curve is the exact energy of, of, of the quantumism chain and the value of gamma. What we call transfer learning here is when, when between two algebraic st uh, steps, we use as input the weights and the biases of the previous algebraic step to somehow encode the annealing paradigm. When we don't do that, when between two subsequent algebraic steps, we use, we randomly initialize our RNN and we use the same number of gradient descent step per annealing step. We find this no transfer learning scheme where you basically go out of the adiabatic scheme, right? So in, in this sense, the adiabaticity here is, uh, or annealing is well captured by this kind of transfer learning parameters. And we see also that the, so this quantity is basically the, 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 the current energy of the RNN minus the exact energy. And that is the error in, in finding exactly the, 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 the ground state energy during annealing. And it's much lower, lower than the gap. So we, we have the instantaneous variational principle that is respected at every step, right? So this slide tells us that quantum annealing dynamics can be well captured with, within this kind of variational quantum protocol. So next I will move on to explain um, the classic part of variational annealing, which is uh, basically this. So here now we have a new cost function, a variational free energy, which is basically uh, made up of two terms. We have the expectation value of the program Hamiltonian over basically distribution of our uh, probability distribution encoded by the RNN minus some temperature de dependence schedule. And then we have that multiplied with the von Neumann entropy. This is uh, easily- You have five more minutes, Esther, sorry. 
Oh, fine, thanks. Which is well uh, captured by uh, using an RNA. So this is another advantage of using RNA as compared to other uh, version answers, right? And so this this version of free energy has all, has a nice property like like what we had in in quantum annealing in, in the sense that it is also an upper bound for free energy, and so we just have to minimize it for each uh, annealing step. So we check that also. So proof of principle we use um, the, the Ising model. And then we look at the instantaneous free energy as we change temperature. And again, we find that uh, we, we are able to capture the, 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 the class can you know, pursue a thermal and you know, procedure here. All right, uh, what I would like to mention is that a similar procedure was, uh, was, was um, used in the article I mentioned before, but they were using that to avoid mode collapse as they were pre uh, preparing or trying to simulate the room dynamics of of the classical system, but here we use it to solve optimization problems. All right, next I will move to uh, results. So we have a res first results on the randomizing chain, and the random randomizing chain is given this by this program Hamiltonian. So we are trying to find the, the, the minimum of this program Hamiltonian. We have uh, basically random couplings between nearest near number of spins. And we consider two kinds of random couplings. One is a uniform disorder between zero and one, and the, the other one is a discrete disorder. So as a metric, we use the, the what we call the residual energy, which is the expectation value of the program Hamiltonian at the end of annealing, uh, respect to the, the, the probability distribution of, 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 of uh, the RNA, minus the exact energy that we know for this one on the zinc chain. We consider three different system sizes. And at the end of the annealing, since the autoregressive sampling is not that expensive, we just generate a million samples. We consider 25 random realization of, of the disorder. And this is the RNA that we use a positive tensor as RNA. And I didn't have time to explain what it is. So here are the result. Um, we have the regenerative per spin in respect to the number of annealing steps. So I should mention here that for both virtual class annealing and virtual quantum annealing, we use the same velocity of annealing. So that it should be kind of a fair comparison that we do here. What we notice is that when the annealing is kind of slow, we are doing some kind of quenching in the system. Uh, the quantum annealing or virtual quantum annealing is superior to virtual classical annealing. But when the annealing is, is, is slow enough, that is the number of annealing steps is long, we see that virtual classical annealing is superior to virtual quantum annealing. And this is the same thing that we observe for the discrete disorder. Actually, this is a very interesting result because it's, it is different from what was found by Zanka and Santoro, where they, they use other formulations of classical and quantum annealing, and they found quantum annealing superior to classical annealing. And most importantly, they found that uh, quantum annealing, the, the residual energy was going down logarithmically, whereas here we see some sort of power of scaling. So here, here virtual annealing is superior to SM, both core and quantum annealing. So next we move to a harder model in 2D, and it was Anderson spin glass, which is characterized by this, by this kind of program Hamiltonian. We consider first a 10 by 10, a, a spin system. And this is a kind of architecture that, that we use for the RNA. And we see again that the blue data VCA is superior to, 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 to the green data. So here again, VCA is superior to, to VQA. We, we try what we call renormalized VQA, whereby we inject a fictitious thermal um, kind of search inside the quantum annealing search. It's a little bit better, but it's still inferior to, to, to quantum annealing. And for this green data, we basically use what uh, the optimization of this program Hamiltonian on our ANSAT. So this depends on the number of gradient descent steps. And we see that as we train the model, though the reason energy is going down, it's still order of magnitude lower than, than VC and VQ. So next we compare VCA with simulated annealing and SQA, simulated quantum annealing performed with pattern of Monte Carlo on a 40 by 40 spin. And we see that for long annealing time, basically VCA is three order of magnitudes bit better than both simulated annealing and simulated quantum annealing. And, and yeah, and so with that, I will conclude. We found that uh, actually we have two different practices in here. So we have a paradigm of, of doing a search in a configuration landscape and one of doing a search in a variational landscape. And it looks like the search in a variational landscape is better than, than the one in configuration landscape. We found that the virtual class scanning is better than simulated annealing, virtual quantum annealing, and simulated quantum annealing. So we advocate that is a good candidate for real world optimization problems. And we find that, that neural progressive neural networks are actually very powerful and that to drive this virtual emulation of both classical and quantum annealing. Right. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, especially Mohammed, 
was the main drive uh, behind the project and did most of the simulations. And especially uh, he's the expert of, on neural network. And for the purpose of this conference, I will mention that Muhammad is actually from Morocco. All right, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I think I am time for questions. Okay, thank you, um, Elisa, for this very nice talk. And thank you for sticking to the time that was allocated. There was actually already a question. I mean, a set of questions from Mathieu on the chat. So I will ask him to unmute himself and ask maybe a couple of those questions and the rest will come in the discussion session later. Yeah. Uh, okay, Estelle, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, okay. So I have uh, some few, three questions that uh, I really need to understand. So uh, the first question is, uh, I'm not uh, really able to cope with the fact that the classical annealing is superior to the quantum annealing, especially uh, at what extent? How do you uh, perform the circle? Yeah. Okay. I mean, for, for sure, I mean, usually there, there's, for most primes that have been tested using let's say Monte Carlo methods, people have found quantum annealing to be superior to classical annealing. Though there were some primes where classical annealing was superior to, to, to quantum annealing. Um, but the, the, the main idea is like what I mentioned. So wait, wait, uh, one second. So if I do this and I come here, so basically the, the idea mostly what people think is about what is this barrier looking like? So if you imagine that you have thin barriers, probably quantum annealing is going to be better. If you have like uh, very large barriers, so thermal annealing and, 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 and not too high, thermal annealing is probably going to be better, to be better. But typically you don't know what is the, the, the form of, of this landscape. For the results that we have obtained, Indeed, for example, if I look like, uh, if I look at this 2D model, it's not clear to us why VCA is better, but one intuition that we have is that, so when we include some kind of fictitious thermal uh, fluctuations in the quantum annealing simulation, we find that quantum annealing is, is kind of better, but this is not the true uh, entropy, quantum entropy that we have, we have introduced. So maybe it could be that if we're able to, to, to to, to use the true free energy of uh, in the quantum simulation is possible for this uh, virtual quantum annealing to be better than virtual classical annealing. But we don't okay. have like so, very strong arguments for that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, but what about uh, the annealing time in classical and uh, in classical and quantum annealing? I mean, they, this is the same, we use the same number of uh, annealing steps for both of them. So the velocity of the annealing is the same for both quantum and classical annealing. In this case, we use a linear schedule for both of them and same initial conditions. Oh, okay. So uh, the second question, so is, uh, I wish to know, is there any possibility to consider the contribution of the environment? That is the stochastic contribution in classical annealing. As you know, uh, practical implementation of this uh, may necessarily uh, need uh, some stochastic contribution from the environment? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something we thought about. It would be interesting indeed to include uh, the environment contribution in, 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 and see how it's going to change. I mean, there's been, there have been work in quantum annealing to show that the annealing actually, uh, environment actually hampers uh, the, the, the quantum annealing uh, schedule, you basically have some sort of minimum, uh, yeah, minimum in, in, in the dependence of the visual energy respect to annealing time. And as you increase the strength of the, 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 the noise, basically you start, I mean, yeah. landing is some uh, better stable state, basically. But here, yeah, it would be interesting to, to include the, the effect of the environment. So I think we can stop for now and we can go to the next speaker.